theme, we'll have Michael Zurel from UBC talking about uh, a hidden variable model for universal quantum computation with magic states on qubits. Go ahead. Thanks, David. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about this new paper that we have called A Hidden Variable Model for Universal Quantum Computation with Magic States on Qubits. It's joint work with Jihan and Robert here at UBC. Um, and it's on the archive now, so if you want to find out more by the end of this, you can find it at the archive link down here at the bottom left corner of the screen. Here's a rough outline of what I'll talk about. Um, first, I'll start by giving a, a review of the computational model we're interested in, which is uh, quantum computation with magic states. Then I'll just briefly summarize the main result. Uh, after that, I'll sort of take a step back and give some background material on uh, classical simulation algorithms for quantum computation with magic states based on discrete Wigner functions. Um, so we have a lot of people here from different backgrounds. I wasn't really sure how much to include in this section. Uh, I erred on the side of including more rather than less. So this section might be a bit slow to some of you, but just bear with me. It'll only be a few slides. And then some of the background in, in John's talk actually sets this up pretty well. So thanks for that. Uh, and then that should put the main result in context. So that, after that, I'll come back to the main result and go through it in a little bit more detail. And then I'll finish by looking at, uh, I'll show you what it looks like in the simplest case, which is one qubit, because there everything's pretty simple and easily visualizable. First, this is the computational model we're talking about. It's quantum computation with magic states. Um, so this is a universal model of quantum computation where you restrict the allowed operations. We restrict to Clifford Gates and Pauli measurements. Uh, so by the goddess Manil theorem, these operations by themselves are not universal for quantum computation. In fact, they're efficiently simulable. Um, but we can restore universality by including extra non-stabilizer input states. So when you include these extra states, uh, you get back to universality. So here's an example of what it looks like. I have a circuit here consisting of only uh, Clifford gates and Pauli measurements. Um, but when I include this non-stabilizer input state, it allows me to effectively implement, implement a T gate. And since Clifford plus T gate set is universal, this shows that this model of quantum computation with magic states is also universal. So now I'll just summarize the main result, uh, which I'll go into in more detail later. <clears throat> the main result is a hidden variable model for quantum computation with magic states. Uh, which has a representation for each of the elements of QC with magic states, including states, Clifford gates, and Pauli measurements. So this is what the representation of states looks like. Uh, rho is a density matrix. Uh, these A sub alphas, they're, they're uh, operators. These are associated with the hidden variables of the model. Um, and we represent states, uh, density matrices, as uh, probabilistic combinations of these operators A. Uh, so this is the representation of a state is just as a probability distribution, P of alpha. Um, Clifford gates, we represent, uh, they're equivalent just to deterministic maps uh, from uh, these operators A sub alpha to other operators. Um, we represent Clifford gates just by de de deterministic maps. Um, and Pauli, Pauli measurements have a similar sort of representation as uh, so what I have here, pi is a, a projector corresponding to performing some Pauli measurement. So A labels the measurement that NASA labels the measurement outcome, and pi is the corresponding projector. So if you project one of these A sub alpha operators, you get a probabilistic combination of um, these A operators back again. Um, so the thing I'll emphasize here is this is a hidden variable model for quantum computation with magic states, um, where all of the elements, the, the states, the Clifford gates, and the Pauli measurements, everything, is represented using only classical probabilities. Um, yeah, so this is the, the main takeaway message. This is the thing to remember. Now I'll sort of take a step back and try to put this result in context. So remember, this, this is the computational model we're talking about. Um, so we have a restricted set of operations, and those operations alone are efficiently simulable. But when you include the magic states, you can restore universal, universality. So something we can say is that the extra computational power of quantum computation lies in the magic states themselves, nothing to do with the operations. And then a question we can ask is which quantum states are useful for quantum computation with magic states? So which states can you put here in the input to restore universe, universality? So we know that not just any state will work. Like a, a stabilizer state wouldn't work. So we want to characterize which states are useful here. 
Um, so this is an important question, and one way of thinking about it is through talking about the um, discrete Wigner functions. Uh, so we'll spend the next few slides just setting up what the discrete Wigner function is, uh, in particular the, the uh, odd dimensional discrete Wigner function. So we're looking at a d-dimensional Hilbert space where d is odd. Um, we have generalized Pauli operators on the space defined by their action here on the computational basis. So the, the generalized x just shifts the computational basis states and z, uh, the computational basis states are eigenstates of z with eigenvalues which are d through to unity. And then we can define the uh, generalized Pauli group to be the group generated by uh, these operations. Um, if we're talking about the n-cutit Pauli uh, group, it's the group generated by these operations acting on n qubits, um, but we only care about them up to uh, phases, so we'll, we'll mod out the phases. Um, and there, there's a little bit of subtlety in keeping track of these phases, um, but it won't be important for what I'm gonna talk about, so I'll just ignore it and pretend everything works out, but in reality, you, you need to be a little bit careful with the phases. Um, so the odd dimensional discrete Wigner function, or the phase space over which it's defined, uh, is based on non-contextual value assignments on the generalized Pauli operators. So we'll, we'll say this capital lambda is the set of all deterministic non-contextual value assignments on the generalized Pauli operators, Pn. <clears throat> so these are, are functions from generalized Pauli's to the d through to unity, so from, from the operators to their eigenvalues that satisfy these two conditions. So first, um, the identity operator has to get assigned to one, and then for any uh, commuting pair of operators, A and B, where A and B commute, the value assigned to the product, AB, has to be equal to the product of the values assigned to A and B. So th this, this is contextuality in the, sen in the Koch and Specker sense, so these are deterministic value assignments. <clears throat> now we can define the phase space over which the uh, discrete Wigner function is defined. Um, so points in the discrete phase space are associated with these non-contextual value assignments on the Pallys. Um, so for each non-contextual value assignment lambda, we have a phase point operator, uh, lab labeled here by A sub lambda, and it's just defined uh, up to normalization by sum over uh, the elements of the NQ to Pally group uh, weighted by the non-contextual value assignment. This is how we define the phase point operators, and there's one of these for each point in the discrete phase space. Um, so again, this is the definition of the phase point operators, and they have some nice properties that are useful for defining the Wigner function. So for example, they're a orthonormal basis uh, for the space of Hermitian operators, um, which means that any density matrix rho can be expanded in this basis. And it's the coefficients here in this expansion that we call the uh, discrete Wigner function. So since these things are orthonormal, if you multiply this equation by a phase point operator and take a trace, you get you can extract the coefficients. So that this you can take as the, the definition of the discrete Wigner function. Okay. Um, so maybe if you're familiar with the uh, original Wigner function from 1932, you're thinking of some function over a position momentum phase space. So that's for infinite dimensional quantum mechanics. Here I'm talking about quantum computation in finite dimensional quantum mechanics. And so instead of being a position momentum phase space, we have a finite number of points in phase space. So this is the sort of picture you should be thinking of. I have here the Wigner functions for two different states. Uh, on the left here, I have, I have a stabilizer state. And you can see that uh, it takes positive values for three points in phase space and zero everywhere else. Uh, and we actually have this theorem, this Reed Hudson's theorem that says all stabilizer states have non-negative Wigner function. And you can sort of think of this as a first indication that uh, the discrete Wigner function might have something interesting to say about uh, quantum computation with magic states, because from a resource theory point of view, uh, the stabilizer states um, are the ones that are considered more classical. And in the original Wigner function, um, negativity in the Wigner function is sort of an indicator of genuine quantumness, whereas the ones with non-negative Wigner function are considered more classical. Um, so this is an interesting result uh, from that point of view. I also have your Another state is a, a, a dissyllable magic state. And it's probably not that easy to see from the picture, but it takes uh, positive values for five points in phase space, but for those four tiles in the back, 
It takes negative values. Uh, so like John said in the previous talk, this is a uh, quasi-probability distribution, meaning it's like a probability distribution that uh, the coefficient is summed to one, um, but they can in general take negative values. Um, but when uh, it is non-negative everywhere, it is just a probability distribution. So this uh, Wigner function in phase space has some other nice properties that make it useful for describing quantum computation with magic states. Um, so in particular, it behaves reasonably well under the dynamical operations uh, of quantum computation with magic states. The two uh, dynamical elements are Clifford gates and value measurements. So first we can look at Clifford gates. Um, so under uh, Clifford gates, uh, phase point operators map deterministically to other phase point operators. That's what I've shown in this picture here. This is the Wigner function representation for one phase point operator. So this is one, a one pointed phase space and zero everywhere else. And this maps deterministically to some other phase point operator under uh, conjugation by a Clifford unitary. So another way to say this is the discrete Wigner function is Clifford covariant, which means if you have some Wigner function for a state rho and you update that state by conjugating it by some Clifford gate, um, you can extract uh, the Wigner function for the updated state just from the Wigner function of, of the original state rho. Um, and one implication this has is that positivity of the Wigner function, or I should say non-negativity of the Wigner function is preserved under this operation. So if, if rho has a non-negative Wigner function after updating it by a Clifford gate, uh, the resulting state will also have a non-negative Wigner function. The other uh, dynamical operation in quantum computation with magic states is Pauli measurements. Uh, we don't have a deterministic map this time, but we have a result that says that uh, phase point operators map to probabilistic combinations of, of other phase point operators uh, under Pauli measurements. <clears throat> uh, but again, uh, this means that positivity of the Wigner function is also preserved under all Pauli measurements. So we have these nice update rules for uh, both of the dynamical operations uh, that exist in quantum computation with magic states, so both Clifford gates and Pauli measurements. And these lead to a classical simulation algorithm for quantum computation with magic states uh, that applies when the input state is non-negative. So remember, this is the picture we're looking at. We have a quantum circuit with some set of uh, Clifford gates and Pauli measurements with some arbitrary input state. Um, and when the Wigner function of this input state is non-negative, uh, it yields a classical simulation algorithm. Um, when, when it is non-negative, it's just a probability distribution, which means we can sample from it. And that's what we do. So this is how the simulation algorithm works. You just sample phase point operators, A sub lambda, according to the Wigner function uh, representation of the uh, input state. And then you can just propagate uh, the phase point operator sampled through the circuit according to uh, the, update, the update rules. <clears throat> so when, whenever you come to a Clifford gate, you have a deterministic map from phase point operators to phase point operators. When you come to a Pauli measurement, you need two things. So you need some way of getting a measurement outcome as well as an update map. Um, so measurement outcomes are easy because phase point operators are associated with these non-contextual value assignments. So if you come to a, a uh, uh, Pauli measurement p, you just return lambda of p, the, the, the value implied by the non-contextual value assignment. And then you also have this uh, the, these, uh, probabilistic update. So you, you'd sample uh, another phase point according to this update map. So just carry on. So just need to sample, uh, propagating these phase points through the circuit and collecting measurement outcomes as you go. This leads to a classical simulation algorithm. Um, so something we can ask now is, what does this classical simulation algorithm tell us? Um, well, since we have a efficient uh, classical simulation algorithm for quantum computation of magic states that applies whenever the input state uh, is has a, has a non-negative Wigner function, um, we know that any state with, with a non-negative Wigner function is not useful for promoting QC with magic states to universality because it's efficiently simulable. Um, when you have states uh, with negativity in the Wigner function, they may be useful. So negativity in the Wigner function of the input state is a necessary condition for quantum computation with magic states to exhibit a speed up over classical computing, let's say that. Um, so what happens when the Wigner function of the input state does take negative values? Uh, well, the original 
simulation algorithm that, that I applied that I described a couple slides ago doesn't work anymore. Um, but there, there is a different simulation algorithm that you can use based on amplitude estimation. Uh, and it again proceeds by sampling from some probability distribution based on the Wigner function. Um, and in that case, the number of samples required for, to achieve a given variance uh, scales proportional to this parameter r squared, where r is defined as just the sum over uh, the absolute values of the Wigner function. And you can think of this as just measure of the amount of negativity in the Wigner function. Because if, if you drop these absolute value signs here, sum all the, all the components, you get one. When you include the absolute value signs, you're just sort of counting the amount of negativity. Um, so I'm not really prepared to make a formal statement about complexity, but in some intuitive sense, uh, the number of samples you need scales proportional to the amount of negativity in the Wigner function. So we can say that in some sense negativity in the Wigner function determines the complexity of classical simulation of quantum computation with magic states. Um, so this is all very nice. It gives us a nice classification of which states are not useful for quantum computation with magic states and which ones might be. Um, but there's an issue with it, which is that, uh, like I said at the start, it only works for odd dimensional qubits. So where the, the local Hilbert space dimension is odd, uh, and things break if you try it for even dimensions. Um, we can look at why things break, so that's what we'll do now. Uh, so remember that this is the definition of the phase point operators. Um, it was defined as a sum over the Pauli operators, the generalized Pauli operators weighted by these non-contextual value assignments. Um, like you look at systems of multiple qubits, you have the state independent proofs of contextuality, things like Merman square, uh, which show that these deterministic and non-contextual value assignments don't exist for systems of multiple qubits or general any system. Um, with even the Mitchell Hilbert space more than two. Uh, so this definition of phase point operators is, is not even really well defined uh, for multiple qubits. Uh, so that's one issue. There isn't another way of defining the odd dimensional phase point operators, uh, which you can sort of generalize to even dimensions. Um, but if you try to do that, uh, like a naive generalization, uh, you lose two properties. So you lose both Clifford covariance of the Wigner function, and you also lose positivity preservation uh, under Pauli measurements. <clears throat> and these were exactly the two properties that we needed uh, to get that classical simulation algorithm, the, the efficient classical simulation algorithm for quantum computation that applied when the Wigner function of the input state was non-negative. So if we're interested in simulating quantum computation, we really need a Wigner function with both these properties. And this idea can be formalized. So we have these two no-go results for qubit Wigner functions. Uh, the first one from 2016 says that no qubit Wigner function where the phase point operators form an operator basis can be Clifford covariance. So if, if you want a Wigner function that's Clifford covariance, um, you need a bigger phase space. You need phase point operators to form some overcomplete set. It can't be a basis. Um, it turns out that the Clifford gates aren't really necessary for computation. You can get by with just the Pauli measurements. So this uh, first no-go result is less of an issue. Uh, but we also have the second no-go result, which gives a memory lower bound. We need O of n squared bits in order to simulate contextuality. Um, and the implication of this result is the same. If we want uh, a discrete Wigner function for systems of multiple qubits, um, and we want it to be useful for simulating quantum computation with magic states, um, then the phase point operators cannot form an operator basis. We need, we need a bigger phase space. <clears throat> this is a issue that we addressed, me and Robert and Jan, along with Kwani and Emily, uh, sometime last year in this paper published in January. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just spend a couple slides talking about how we address this, this issue. Um, so remember the phase point operators uh, in odd dimensions were defined based on non-contextual value assignments on the generalized Pauli operators. But for systems of multiple qubits, those non-contextual value assignments don't generally exist. Um, but they do exist for subsets of the Pauli operators. Uh, so we look at subsets of the Pauli operators. Omega is a subset of the Pauli operators satisfying uh, these two conditions. <clears throat> so these are the sets we're looking at. Um, so this first condition on the sets omega, uh, we call closure under inference. It says if, if you have two operators in the set and they commute, then the product also has to be in the set. 
it's called closure interference for obvious reasons. If you can measure each of these operators and you can infer the value of the product. Um, the second condition is non-contextuality. So we just require that there exists a non-contextual value assignment on the set. Uh, so if you have a set satisfying both of these constraints, we call it a CNC set, CNC for closed and non-contextual. And these are some examples of CNC sets for uh, two qubit pally operators. So you, you can't have the full Merman square because you get contextuality then, uh, but you can have these two different types of subsets of the Merman square operators. You can have two different measurement contexts that intersect in one place, or you can have these three pairwise anti-commuting operators. These are both examples of CNC sets. And then we define phase point operators, um, similar to how we did it in the odd-dimensional case. Uh, so there's a sum over the Pauli operators. Um, difference being that instead of summing over all of the Pauli operators, we only sum over the ones in the set omega. Uh, and again, they're weighted by the non-contextual value assignments. So th this is what the phase point operators would look like for this CNC set here, the one on the right. <clears throat> this construction is pretty general. It actually works for any number n of qubits with any local Hilbert space dimension d. Um, the idea is the same. You restrict to subsets omega of the Pauli group or generalized Pauli group, satisfying these two constraints. So first, um, closure under inference. If you have two operators in the set and they commute, then the product also has to be in the set. And second one, non-contextuality just says there has to be some non-contextual value assignment on the set. Then we have a point in phase space for each pair, omega and lambda, where omega is a CNC set and lambda is a non-contextual value assignment on the set. And then we define a phase point operator for this pair as uh, up to some normalization, the sum over the Pauli operators weighted by uh, the non-contextual value assignment. So these things are in general a uh, overcomplete set for space information operators. So you can expand any state represented by a density matrix in these operators. And again, just like in the odd dimensional case, you take the coefficients in this expansion to be the discrete Wigner function. So this is where we come to a difference between the Wigner function in uh, even dimensions and odd dimensions. If you look at odd dimensions, uh, there are non-contextual value assignments on the full set of generalized Pauli operators and the technical reason why we only need to consider maximal CNC sets, CNC sets that are not contained in larger CNC sets. Um, so for odd dimensions, the only maximal CNC set is the full set of generalized Pauli operators. Uh, and if you have omega being the full set of Pauli operators, you just get back the original odd dimensional phase point operators. And then the definition of the Wigner function is exactly the same as I defined it before. Uh, so in that case, the phase point operators form a basis and the Wigner function is unique. Uh, for systems of multiple qubits, um, you have these two varying parameters. So uh, the non-contextual value assignments is one parameter, but you also have the set over which it's defined being another parameter that determines a point in phase space. And so you end up with a much bigger phase space, um, which means that the Wigner function is not unique. So there could be many different decompositions of this form, each giving a valid Wigner function. Um, so the, you can think of that as the cost we pay to get back these properties that we want for simulating quantum computation. So this generalized phase space uh, consisting of these pairs, omega and lambda, it has the properties that we wanted uh, to form the classical simulation algorithm. Um, namely, it behaves well under the two types of dynamical operations, the Clifford gates and the Pauli measurements. Um, so just like in the odd dimensional case, uh, generalized phase point op operators map deterministically to other phase point operators under Clifford group operations, um, which means the generalized Wigner function is Clifford covariant. And also uh, phase point operators map to probabilistic combinations of phase point operators under Pauli measurements. And this means positivity of the Wigner function is preserved under both of these operations. So these were exactly the properties we needed for the uh, efficient classical simulation algorithm to work. Um, so I'll just go through what it looks like for uh, qubits, multiple qubits. So remember that this is the picture we're talking about. We have a quantum circuit of Clifford gates and Pauli measurements with some input state. Um, if the Wigner function representation of the input state is positive or non-negative, 
then it's just a probability distribution we can sample from it. So that's what we do. We sample phase point operators uh, now labeled by these two parameters, omega and lambda, according to this probability distribution. And we can propagate these things through the circuit. Uh, so we get a determinist deterministic map whenever you come to a Clifford gate. Um, when you come to a Pali measurement, you need uh, an update and a way of getting measurement outcomes. Uh, so first, we'll look at measurement outcomes. If you come to a Pali measurement P, and P is in the set omega of that phase point, um, then you just return lambda of P, the value implied by the non-contextual value assignment. If you come to a measurement P, which is not in the set, then you can just return plus one or minus one with equal probability. <clears throat> and since phase point operators map to probabilistic combinations of phase point operators under uh, Pali measurements, you, you, you can sample one of those phase point operators in the distribution and just carry on through the circuit. So same idea as the odd dimensional case. You're, you're just sampling these phase point operators and propagating them through the circuit and collecting measurement outcomes as you go. And we also have the same sort of simulation algorithm that works when the Wigner function representation of the input state is negative. It takes negative values. Um, so when W is negative in some places, it's a quasi-probability representation, not a probability representation, and you get a simulation algorithm by amplitude estimation. And just like in the odd dimensional case, the number of samples required scales proportional to a parameter r squared, where r, again, counts the amount of negativity in the Wigner function. This is another difference between the even dimensional case and the odd dimensional case. Since uh, in even dimensions, uh, the Wigner function is not unique, the one you're gonna wanna choose for the simulation is the one with the minimal amount of negativity. Um, so that's the one you're gonna use in the simulation, which means the parameter R that determine, determines the complexity of the simulation is gonna be the one that uh, minimizes the amount of negativity. So now I'm coming back to the main result that we have. Um, first, I'm gonna take a step back and we'll think about what all of these uh, classical simulation algorithms based on these quasi-probability representations have in common. Um, so if you want to define a classical simulation algorithm based on a quasi-probability representation, they, they usually proceed similar kind of way. You start by defining a set of phase point operators. Um, these are your points in phase space. I call them A sub alpha here with uh, alpha indexing the operators and V being the generalized phase space, the discrete phase space. So you start by defining the set of operators. Then you need to ensure that the operators behave well under the relevant dynamics, which in our case are Clifford gates and Pali measurements. So when I say behave well, I mean the phase point operators map either deterministically to other phase point operators or to probabilistic combinations of phase point operators under both of these operations. Um, so once you have the second property, um, then you can say the states for which the uh, classical simulation algorithm applied are those in the convex hull of the phase point operators, which just mean, uh, that just means the simulation algorithm will work for any state that you can represent as a probabilistic combination of the phase point operators. So if rho is a state and you can express it as a probabilistic combination of these phase point operators, then you have a simulation algorithm for a state with rho as an input um, based on the weaker function. <coughs> This is usually the way it goes. Um, for defining the hidden variable model that I'm going to get to, it makes sense to um, sort of go in the other direction. Um, so you can start by looking at what this shape looks like, what this convex hull of the phase point operators. Um, it's just, it's going to be some geometric shape with a finite number of vertices and flat sides. It's just a, a polytope. Um, so something you can do is go in the opposite direction. So everything. I have here is equivalent to what I had in the previous slide. It's just we're going in the other direction. So we're, we're going to start by defining this polytope delta, this sort of geometric shape with flat sides, and finite number of vertices in uh, the space of Hermitian operators. <clears throat> so once we have the, the polytope delta defined, we're going to identify the vertices of delta of the polytope with uh, phase points. So those, the, the vertices are going to be our generalized phase points. Now, Property three here is what we need in order for the classical simulation algorithm to work. Um, we need to make sure that delta behaves well under the relevant dynamics, the Clifford unitaries and Pelly measurements, which just means that delta maps back into itself under both of these operations. 
And then this is some polytope in the space of Hermitian operators. The states, the physical quantum states for which the simulation algorithm applies, are those which are inside delta, inside the polytope. So this is, instead of sort of taking the traditional route of defining a Wigner function, this is the route I'm going to take for defining the Wigner function I'm going to get to here. Um, so a question we can ask is, um, what happens if we choose this polytope delta to be as large as possible, such that uh, subject to the constraint that property number three is still satisfied? So three was the constraint that ensures that the classical simula simulation algorithm still works. We want delta to be as big as possible, such that we still get a classical simulation algorithm from it. And if you try to do that, it turns out this is the uh, set that you get. We call it lambda in the paper, capital lambda. So I'll just bend the slide uh, telling you what lambda is. Uh, so first, this is the space it lives in. We call it O of 2 to the n. Uh, it's the space of trace 1. It's, it's the affine uh, subspace of the vector space of Hermitian matrices with trace 1. Um, so that's the space in which this set lives. Um, we'll say Sn is the set of all pure n qubit stabilizer states. Then we'll define lambda n to be the subset of the space uh, defined by the fact that any x in the set has to satisfy all of these inequalities. So for each stabilizer state, um, we take the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product of the stabilizer state with x. You have to get something non-negative. <coughs> So these inequalities have sort of natural interpretation. Uh, if x were a physical density matrix, um, then this uh, trace would have the interpretation as being uh, the probability of obtaining a certain sequence of outcomes given you perform some set of uh, commuting Kali measurements on the state x. Um, we don't require that x be a uh, physical density matrix, meaning we don't we don't require that it be positive semi-definite. Um, we only require that it give uh, uh, non-negative probabilities for these projectors on the stabilizer states. So th this, this is the set lambda. Um, this is the central object uh, that's going to be important for defining the hidden variable model. And I'll just go through some properties of this set. Um, so first property that's interesting is uh, for any Clifford unitary u, uh, lambda maps back into itself under conjugation by Clifford unitary. Um, so that's a very nice property. One of the things we need for classical, classical simulation. Second one is a little bit more complicated to state. It says if you have an x in the set lambda and this trace with uh, pi, so pi is a projector corresponding to a Pauli measurement. As a labels a Pauli measurement and s labels a measurement outcome. Pi is the corresponding projector. Uh, if you have if, if you take this trace uh, of x with a projector and you get something positive, this would be interpreted as, as the probability of obtaining outcome s given you perform measurement a on x. Uh, if it gives a, a positive probability, then the post-measurement state also has to map back into lambda. So this is just saying that lambda max ba maps back into itself under Pauli measurements as well. Um, so these are the two properties we needed for um, classical simulation, for the simulation algorithm to work. We also have this third property of the set lambda, which puts us beyond the uh, simulation algorithm, algorithms based on the discrete Wigner function, which says that um, lambda contains all n qubit states, all physical n qubit states. So the, the proofs of these three properties are pretty simple. So let's go through each of them. Um, third one is almost trivial. Um, there's basically two things you need to check. So first, uh, any density matrix representing a physical state is a Hermitian trace one operator. Um, and also it gives positive probabilities or non-negative probabilities for any sequence of value measurements. So almost by definition, any physical state is in the set lambda. You can check the first property now. So update under Clifford unitaries. Um, so the statement we want to prove is uh, if you have some x in the set lambda and a Clifford unitary u, then x conjugated by u uh, is also in the set lambda. So there's two things we need to check. Both are pretty simple. One is this thing has to have trace one. Um, it's easy enough to show you just move u to the other side. And then you end up with trace of x. And since x is in the set, it has trace one. And so the trace of this is also one. Uh, and then the other thing we need to check is that 
the inner product of uh, ux u dagger with any stabilizer state is non-negative. So same idea, you move u dagger to the other side. Um, now you have uh, a Clifford unitary u acting on a stabilizer state. So that just maps it to another stabilizer state. Um, so we end up with this trace inner product of uh, x with a different stabilizer state. And six, since x is in the set lambda, this is also non-negative. <clears throat> so this shows that um, lambda maps back into itself under any Clifford unitary. Now we can do poly measurements. It's a little bit more complicated, but not really all that complicated still. So we want to show that lambda maps back into itself under poly measurements. So suppose you have an x in the set lambda, and you want to perform a poly measurement TA on x. So A labels the poly measurement. Uh, and suppose it gives an outcome S with this probability, which is positive, it's not zero. Um, then this is the post-measurement state corresponding to that measurement. Um, and we want to show that this post-measurement state is in the set lambda. So there's two things we need to check again. First, that X prime, the post-measurement state, has a unit trace, and it does by definition. Um, and the other thing we need to check is that uh, the inner product of X prime with any stabilizer state is non-negative. Uh, so this is the, so the denominator here is, is positive by assumption. So we can look at the inner product of uh, the numerator uh, with a stabilizer state. Uh, we just move the, uh, this projector to the other side. We have a poly projector acting on a stabilizer state. So this is just standard stabilizer formalism techniques. Um, this is equal to a constant C times uh, the inner product of X with a different stabilizer state. So in particular, C is, is one of this operator, minus one to the power S times T sub A is in the stabilizer of the stabilizer state sigma. Um, if minus this operator is in the stabilizer, then you get C equals zero. And in any other case, C is one half. Um, so in this expression here, C is positive in all three of the cases. And since sigma prime is a stabilizer state and X is in lambda, uh, this other factor is also non-negative. And so this shows that uh, the inner product of the post-measurement state with any stabilizer state is non-negative. And this shows that uh, under Pelly measurements, lambda maps back into itself. <clears throat> so those are some interesting properties of the set lambda. Now what can we do with them? Um, so in the first line here, I just restated the definition of lambda. So it, it's the subset of the space. Um, satisfying all of these inequalities. There's gonna be one of these inequalities for each stabilizer state. So you can prove that this set is, uh, it's pretty easy to do it. You can prove that it's uh, closed and compact and bounded and convex and whatever else you want, um, which means uh, and it's a fairly uncomplicated object with flat sides and finite number of vertices. Um, and you can equivalently describe lambda n as the convex hull of its vertices. So I'm going to suggestively call the vertices of lambda uh, a sub alpha. Um, you can equivalently describe lambda as the set of all uh, points x in this space, which are described as, as uh, probabilistic combinations of the vertices of, of lambda. <clears throat> so the reason I'm calling them a sub alpha for obvious reasons is these are going to be our generalized phase point operators uh, with alpha indexing the phase point operators and v being the generalized phase space now. So now I can come back to basically what I had on the first slide, which is the description of the hidden variable model. Um, so again, it's, it's a hidden variable model uh, with a representation for each of the elements of quantum computation with the magic states. So it has a representation for states, uh, for Clifford unitaries, and for Pauli measurements. So this is what uh, the representation for states looks like. So since we proved that any state is in the set lambda, any state can be described as a probabilistic combination of the vertices of lambda. So we just re represent any state um, by these, this probability distribution, P sub rho of alpha. Um, we didn't prove this second one. Uh, we proved that lambda maps back into itself under Clifford unitaries. You can, it's, it takes a little bit more work, but you can also prove that with this stronger condition that says uh, vertices of lambda map to other vertices under conjugation by uh, Clifford group elements. Um, this is a slightly stronger condition that I'm not going to prove. Um, 
that this is also true. So that this is the representation of uh, Clifford gates. Uh, they're just deterministic maps between the vertices, from vertices to vertices of lambda. <clears throat> and then we have this representation for Pauli measurements as well. Um, so pi is a projector uh, corresponding to a Pauli measurement. We showed that uh, this post measurement state is in the set. If we drop the normalization here, uh, this projected operator uh, can be described as a uh, combination of vertices of lambda where these coefficients are all non-negative. Um, and it turns out that this is actually a probability distribution. Well, really it's a family of probability distributions labeled by alpha and A, alpha being the vertex and A being the Pauli measurement. And the variables of the probability distribution are beta labeling, again, the vertices of lambda and S labeling the measurement outcome. This, this is the representation for uh, Pauli measurements is in terms of these, uh, this family of, of uh, probability distributions. <clears throat> so one thing I'll, I'll emphasize again is uh, this gives something, this picture gives something which structurally looks very similar to um, the discrete Wigner functions and the internalized Wigner function um, and all those other quasi-probability representations. The key difference being that there's no negativity anywhere. So there's no negativity in the representation of the states, the operations, or the measurements. Um, yes, yeah, so that, that, that's the main takeaway is it's a hidden variable model something like a quasi-probability representation, except there's no quasi-probabilities, everything is just probabilities. <clears throat> um, so because we have nice update rules under Clifford Gates and Pauli measurements, we get a classical simulation algorithm for quantum computation with magic states, um, similar to the ones based on the quasi-probability representations, except where those ones only worked when the Wigner function of the input state was non-negative. Here, the equivalent of the Wigner function uh, these coefficients here, this is always just a probability distribution. There's never any negativity. So this applies for any input state. Um, but the, the idea of the, of the simulation algorithm is the same, is uh, you look at the uh, probability representation of, of the input state, you sample uh, generalized phase point operators according to this probability distribution of the input state, and then you propagate those phase point operators through the circuit. Uh, we have a deterministic update map whenever you encounter a Clifford gate. Um, when you come to a Pauli measurement, you need a way of updating as well as getting a measurement outcome. And that just comes from sampling from this probability distribution. So when, when you sample from this, you get two things. You get a beta and an S. So S is the, the measurement outcome that you return, and beta is uh, the phase point that you update to. This is propagating phase point operators through the circuit uh, yields this classical simulation algorithm for quantum computation with magic states that works for any input state. <clears throat> so that's the hidden variable model. Now I'll just show you what it looks like uh, in the simplest case, which is one dimension, because here you know, it's, everything's three dimensional, it's easily visualizable. Um, so th the one qubit case is not new. It's the same as uh, the eight state model from here. It's also the same as uh, if you look at one qubit, uh, the one qubit representation of, of the the uh, generalized Wigner function that I defined before based on the CNC sets and the non contextual value assignments. If you look at one qubit, you, you also get uh, the same model. Um, but it's still a good illustration of what happens in general. So I'll, I'll just go through uh, what it looks like. So for one qubit, this sphere represents, this, this is the block sphere, represents the space of states. So the, uh, the pure states are on the surface of the sphere, the mixed states are the interior. Um, the set lambda, polytope lambda, is the cube basically in, inscribing the block sphere. Um, so the phase point operators, or, or the hidden variables, whatever you want to call them, of the model are identified with the corners, the eight vertices of the cube. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty simple picture. Um, when you go to uh, more qubits, you add more qubits. The geometry gets a little bit more complicated. So you go to a higher dimensional space. So for for uh, two qubits, you're in a 15 dimensional space, and four, four qubits dimension grows exponentially. But the idea is the same. So you'll, you'll have some fairly complicated set of states, and you enclose that set of states in a much less complicated uh, shape with a finite number of vertices. And it's those vertices um, 
that you call the generalized phase point operators. <clears throat> so then we can look at what happens under the dynamical operations in the one qubit version. Uh, so here's an example of a Clifford unitary, H is a Hadamard gate. Um, and under a Hadamard gate, phase points map uh, deterministically to other phase points. So each red arrow here represents what happens, represents the update under the Hadamard gate. I've represented the same thing uh, on the cube here geometrically. So each arrow is a de deterministic update of a vertex uh, under a Hadamard gate. And th this is true in general uh, for any number of qubits. Update by Clifford gates is deterministic. Uh, Pali measurements are not deterministic. They're probabilistic, um, but still fairly simple. So for example, if you're at this vertex here in the front and you perform a Pali Z measurement, you'll map uh, either back to the same vertex with probability one half, or you'll map to this vertex on the other side also with probability one half. So geometrically, you're, you're, you're mapping you know, in the middle of this face here. But in terms of the hidden variable model, we represent that as a, a probabilistic combination of uh, this vertex again, and then that vertex over there. <clears throat> so in terms of simulation, uh, for the simulation algorithm, you'll, you'll flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, you follow the red path, and if, if it comes up tails, you follow the blue path. Again, pretty simple. And this was true for any vertex. Um, if you perform a Pali Z measurement or any, any Pali measurement, you'll either map to the same vertex or some other vertex with probability one half. Um, so I think I'm running out of time. Um, so I'll just summarize uh, what I have presented so far. Um, what we have here is a hidden variable model for universal quantum computation with magic states, um, where all of the elements of computation, including comprising the, the states, the operations, and the measurements are represented using only uh, classical probabilities. So it's, it's structurally similar to the representations, the, the, the quasi-probability representations, except for the fact that there's no negativity anywhere. Um, so I have a couple more things to say, but I, I think they're less important. So I'll, I'll just finish it here. Great, thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, I guess we have time for some questions. And we have one in the Q&A first, Michael, if you want to look. Uh, see, I can't see the Q&A. OK, let me read it to you. Um, Thanks for the talk, Michael. Very nice results from Ernesto. Uh, the simulation for magic state injection is surely not efficient. Why not? How does the number of face point operators A scale as the number of qubits increases? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so that, uh, that was one of the things I was going to say next was comment on the, the efficiency of the simulation algorithm. Um, so it seems like uh, since it's it's similar to the quasi the simulation is based on the quasi probability representations and in, in that case uh, we had an efficient simulation algorithm whenever the Wigner function was uh, not negative we've eliminated negativity um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we've eliminated uh, or that we've made the simulation algorithm efficient for all states uh, it just means that the inefficiency has to come from somewhere else so uh, it could come from blow up in the size of, of the Chase space, so the number of vertices of, of this shape, lambda, uh, or it could come from difficulty in, in sampling from the probability distribu distributions come up. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. It doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, since we've eliminated neg negativity, it, do it doesn't necessarily mean that the simulation is efficient. Um, and then the second question was, uh, I, I can see it here now. Um, how does the number of phase points uh, scale the number of qubits. Um, we don't really know. We know that it scales very quickly. Um, so for example, uh, or to compare it with the Wigner functions, uh, the naive generalization of the Wigner function to qubits, uh, the number of points scales like four to the n. So for one qubit, you have four points. For two, you have 16. For the, the, the generalized Wigner function, um, based on the CNC sets that I talked about earlier, uh, it scales much faster. Um, so for one qubit, you have eight points. For two, you have 432, I think. Here, it scales much faster again. Uh, so for one qubit, you have eight. For two, you have 22,320, something like this. Um, so I don't know uh, formally what the scaling is, but it seems to scale very quickly. Um, and it's at least four to the n squared or something like that. Probably, possibly more. I don't really know. <clears throat> 
it looks like there's another question here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I can read it out. Oh yeah, I can, I can read it. So the, the question says, this new Wigner function for universal uh, quantum circuits is really nice construction, great work, thanks. Um, I was wondering what the memory cost needed to represent states uh, in this hidden variable model. Um, what are the best bounds known for number of vertices? Are there any known bounds beyond Ranjai's lower bound? Um, and also, what does uh, contextuality show in the model? Um, again, great questions. Um, I'm not sure I can give satisfying answers to all of them. Um, like I said, I, I don't know precisely the scaling of the number of points in phase space. And I guess that's what would determine the uh, memory cost. Uh, so I, I don't think I can answer that one in a satisfying way. Um, contextuality of the model, uh, that's something that I want to find out more about. It's not something, it's not a settled question. Um, so I, I, I think there's an issue talking about contextuality of the model in terms of the, in, in the, the coach and specker sense, because uh, it has uh, probabilistic value assignments instead of deterministic value assignments. So I'm not sure what to say there. Um, we can talk about it in other versions of contextuality. So for example, Speckens contextuality, I think it's measurement non-contextual, transformation non-contextual, but preparation contextual. Um, yeah, so th this is something we're, we're looking into more and I want to find out more about. And that, that's all I can say on contextuality for now. Um, we have another question. It says, uh, I'm confused about the following. Um, oh, I lost the question. Oh, there it is. I'm confused about the following. Uh, n qubit quantum mechanics is contextual, uh, and contextuality and negativity of quasi probability representations are equivalent notions of classicality. So, in which sense do you say um, there's no negativity? What am I missing? Um, yeah, so. Uh, there's an assumption that people often make for quasi-probability representations of quantum mechanics that we have dropped, um, which is that uh, you, usually for quasi-probability representations, or, or maybe often, um, you have an assumption of convex linearity, uh, which, which means that the, the map from states to distributions over the hidden variables is linear, uh, and we don't have that assumption. Um, so if, if you drop that assumption, you can uh, eliminate all of the negativity, um, but uh, it means you, you get uh, preparation contextuality in the second sense. Um, so if, if you try to reverse that decision and restore this linearity assumption, um, then negativity shows up again. <clears throat> I hope that answers your question. Um, I, I have a question. Um, yeah, sure. You also uh, apparently need over completeness, right? So I guess I yeah. want to ask like the the reverse question of what was asked of me. Like, do you not think that having over completeness sort of uh, weakens the notion of negativity as as a as a distinction from classicality? Um, I mean, yeah, it it could, uh, and this result seems to suggest that it, it definitely does because we've eliminated the negativity and we're still representing universal quantum computation. Um, it doesn't mean negativity is trivial, something that we can forget about. Um, it just means um, for the, the particular setting we're looking at, which is not full quantum mechanics, it's, it's quantum computation where we re restrict the set of operations. Um, in this particular setting, um, what we really want is um, non-negativity preservation under, under the dynamics. Um, and we have those results, no-go results that say, if you want both of those, uh, you need something over complete. A basis doesn't work. Um, so give it, given that concession, um, you can look at uh, what you can do next. Um, so given, given that you need some bigger phase space, um, I guess what we showed here is that if you, uh, drop that assumption of a basis, and you also drop the assumption of linearity of that map, uh, then you can eliminate all the negativity. Do you, um, uh, just to so, follow up, do you have uh, any idea about what the trade-off between uh, the, the apparent explosion and number of hidden variables you need versus like 
the, the savings you get with the efficiency, like given a certain number of hidden variables? Um, like, is it in your I, favor or not? Uh, I don't think I can comment precisely on, 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 on that, just because we I don't really know how fast the size of the face space blows up. Um, but it, it's not really unexpected. Um, we've eliminated negativity, so we've eliminated that source of inefficiency. You would, would sort of expect efficiency to show up somewhere else so that we're not classically efficiently simulating all of quantum computation. So one, one of the places that could show up is, is the blow up in the size of the phase space. Yeah, so, yeah. Let's maybe answer one more question from the Q&A and then we can move further discussion to the session afterwards. Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, so the last question I see here is, um, multi-qubit states uh, are thought to uh, present contextuality for any conventional worker function. Uh, what are the repercussions of your uh, positive representation on this form of contextuality? Um, so th I think I sort of answered this question already. Um, really, the answer is, is it's something I'm looking into and I want to find out more about. Um, what I can say is uh, I'm not really sure how to comment on Coach and Specker's style of contextuality because the uh, the value assignments that we're talking about um, they're probabilistic rather than deterministic, and Coach and Specker seems to assume deterministic value assignments. Um, probabilistic value assignments do come up in like Specken's contextuality, generalized contextuality, uh, and in that sense, uh, we are measurement uh, sorry, measurement non-contextual, transformation non-contextual, and preparation contextual, as far as I know. So I, I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Great, thanks a lot. Then uh, thanks. thanks again for the talk. And Robert, do you want to maybe um, talk about the discussion session?